Raise a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the father said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome, one and all, to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, pushing back the timetables ever further on ancient migrations into North America and other mysteries, and of course, as always, sifting through the mysteries of the ancient past. Joining me here and now as we pony up are my friends, my cohorts, and my colleagues, James Waldo, geologist extraordinaire, and Jason Pintrail. Gentlemen... Welcome again, and how are you? Hey, doing great. Uh, guess what, everyone? School is back in session. Yeah, that's right. We have the youngins back in school. Uh, so uh, more time to do things like cut the grass and take care of the house. But, you know, summer's starting to wind down. The temperatures are getting a little nicer. And uh, it's that magical time of year. I used to hate this time of the year going back to school. But uh, luckily, my son, uh, my oldest son, is really enjoying it. So I'm happy for him. Yeah. You know, if you're, yeah. a, if you're a student of life, every day is school, right? That's what they say. Yeah, that, that's what I hear. So uh, I hadn't had school-age kids in a while. I, I do have a, one in college, um, so that's kind of kind of pricey. But um, so, yeah, not much to add add to that. But uh, I, am, I enjoy the summertime, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it winding down a little bit because, uh, you know, some of those outdoor chores that we have to do, a lot more pleasant when it's like, I don't know, 75 degrees instead of 105 degrees. Well, here and now in Asheville, where I am, you know, I've been kind of globe trotting the last several months. I was in California a few weeks ago. Uh, a few days ago, I was in Cape Girardeau. Here I am back in the land of the sky. But James, it's 60 degrees. Well, not 60. I'm sorry. It's 66 degrees here in Asheville right now, which is still pretty cool. About an hour before we got behind the microphone, I was walking around realizing how chilly I was. And I was like, you know, this is uh, unusual for August, 66 degrees at three o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. I mean, but then again, that's what they say about Asheville, right? You know, if you don't like the weather, just wait 15 minutes. It'll change. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it seems like everywhere I've ever lived, they say the same thing about it. Just stick around. It'll change. You know, Oklahoma. Yeah. So, but I'll take some of that 66 degrees. That, that's, that'd be nice. It's lovely. I mean, it feels like fall right here in Asheville right now. And, you know, you could say the same thing about archaeology. Well, if you don't like people's perspectives on the past, just wait a few minutes. It'll change because that seems to happen all the time as the paradigms continue to shift. I want to get in just a moment into this story that Jason brought to the table about this mammoth kill site because it's potentially one of those kind of stories. But first, this is just kind of a neat one to throw into the mix that I came across this week over at Heritage Daily. And they note that archaeologists from the University of Manchester, in collaboration with University of Cardiff and Herefordshire County Council, have discovered rock crystals during excavations at Doorstone Hill in Herefordshire, England. And the significance of these seems to be that these rock crystals marked grave sites. They say this particular site is a unique complex consisting of timber halls, burial mounds, and enclosures that date from the early Neolithic period. That's about 6,000 years ago. But these rock crystals found at Doorstone Hill are a rare type, they say, of transparent quartz, which they say forms in large hexagonal gems. They appear to have been napped, and based on these images I'm seeing here, that seems evident, and they were intentionally deposited, they say, within burial mounds. And so experts essentially think that these crystalline forms were left at these sites over many generations, potentially for up to 300 years. Now, looking at these images, James, you'd said that they looked almost like obsidian, and now that I look at the images, I can see that too, but I could also see it looking kind of like a smoky quartz, obviously having been napped. That's a finer grade of quartz than the kind you find around here. Our quartz here in the Appalachian Mountains is relatively inferior most of the time, but I've actually come across lithics that are pretty nice. I mean, there are from time to time some really nice uh, veins of quartz that were found. These seem to be that, and these probably the offshoots of flint napping, but they said that they would leave these little crystalline bits in these burial mounds, seemingly of some kind of, oh yeah, you guessed it, ceremonial significance. Now we always think that, right? What if there was something else that was going on? What if in successive stages of the construction of burial mounds, they sat on top of these things and they did their flint napping, right? 
But then again, I guess that the scatter patterns you would find if it had merely been flint napping might have been indicative of that. Because sometimes you can find that. If you find an old hunt site and there are, you know, the shards of, of flint that have been left behind from where someone was obviously shaping a point, I mean, you can usually tell by that sort of dispersal pattern what in likelihood was going on there. Unless over time a road is cut through an area and it's kind of redeposited some of those. But in this case, the archaeologists seem to think that based on the way that they found these in the location that they were found, I guess, in situ or presumably, that there was some sort of a ritual significance. But again, the other take on this is that we always say everything has ritual significance. If we can't understand it, if we can't explain it, anthropologists generally tend to gravitate toward there being some sort of mystical significance, at least as seen by those ancient people who did these things. So I don't know. What are your takes, guys? James, I'll start with you. Looking at this, it does look obsidian-esque, at least in the photographs, obviously a kind of quartz. Yeah, so so there's a couple of interesting things here. Um, one is the description of, of the quartz itself and how it grows into these hexagonal crystals, which is that, that takes a very kind of a specific geologic setting for that to occur. And it actually happens here in Arkansas at Hot Springs. And Jason, you went down there with me, and I don't know if you guys ever heard of this, but there's a lot of people that go down and mine for quartz crystals in that part of the state. And that's the type of crystals that that they're describing here. But what's what's uh, interesting to me about this is this material is not clear quartz. It's a very dark colored uh, quartz. And while you were reading the uh, article, I actually pulled up the paper and and looked at uh, some of the figures they've got. And uh, so they've got a thing. I I won't bore you with it, but there's such a thing called crystallography. Uh, and it's an offshoot of mineralogy, and it's a way to, uh, it's a way to classify uh, crystal growth. And there's a whole, it's super complicated. It's probably the hardest course I ever took in, in geology altogether. And uh, I think I got a C in it, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. And I was happy <laughs> to get that, honestly. But um, so that's pretty interesting. And it sounds like that the geology in that area is somehow similar to the geology here, but here the quartz crystals grow, they're clear. And they're really fantastic looking. Sometimes you get these almost like these huge bouquets of these things. And they're, you know, they, they, they have all these offshoots of these hexagonal crystals. So, uh, so obviously the, you know, the, the people that had manipulated this material um, were, were obviously able to discover it naps pretty well. And, you know, the, and then they place it on the graves. And, and I mean, honestly, that was probably the nicest stuff they own. They're like, this is the, we're putting the nice stuff in the grave with you guys because this is the coolest thing we've got, right? Is or, you know, or these of these these crystals. So, um, so yeah, kind of a lot going on there. Uh, it's very interesting. Oh yeah, it really is. But I mean, when we're out there, you know, walking around, if I find a really nice piece of quartz uh, similar to this, it doesn't have a lot of inclusions, you know, cracks and things like that. If it's almost crystal clear like that, I'm inclined to pick those pieces of quartz up too. I mean, I as a appreciator of geology as a rock collector of sorts you know i picked those things up so i could definitely see ancient people doing the same so getting back to what you're talking about micah with the ceremonial significance you know it's almost a running joke sometimes in the world of archaeology but you know oftentimes i think it's an easy way to describe something that we don't really know that much about and again i think something that tends to happen a lot is people forget to think about the just daily lives of these people. You know, what did they do on an average day? Not, you know, not ceremonial, not ritualistic, but what was just an average day like? And when you stop for a moment and kind of put yourself in those positions, you know, it get, kind of gives you a different realization of what may have been important to them, why they used certain materials, how they interacted with their environment. And, you know, if you read some of the early explorer journals, Uh, There's a lot of good material out there that talks about when European explorers were first uh, encountering indigenous folks here in North America, and they're journaling a lot of what they're seeing. And when you're able to go back and kind of see it from that perspective of just someone chronicling what the daily life is like, it gives you a different perspective. And you begin to understand that not everything was necessarily ceremony or ritual, but was just a part of something that was appreciated in their daily lives. And so it's really interesting to go back and read those early journals and texts from those explorers because it does kind of fill in some of the gaps and paint the pictures of a normal interaction, you know, a a Monday through Friday type scenario, uh, what they would do from sunup to sundown. And it kind of gives you a better perspective of the cultures uh, overall. So I think those things are definitely valuable, but it's always nice to, uh, to read something like this. And it, 
you know, it just shows you that even then, regardless of the time period, you know, people are people, you know, they, they appreciate nice things. They want to pass that on to their loved ones. They want to use those type of things to mark special times, special occasions, special events in life. And uh, again, we've said this many times, you know, these people were the same as we are now. They did very similar things. And I think it's, you know, always interesting to look back and just see how people processed things, emotions and thoughts and, and all the things that we deal with today, but in their own time period. Absolutely. Yeah. And speaking of processing things, processing mammoth remains in the ancient world, that must have been a real chore just to be able to have a steak dinner. But, you know, Jason, there's recent evidence at one of these sites, and it's telling us even more than just what the folks were having for dinner. In fact, it's showing us, well, let's just say that they were early diners. They were eating dinner much earlier than we thought, like, I mean, a few thousand years earlier than we thought right here in the good old North Americas. Well, that seems to be the case, but we'll get into that as we go. So the headline coming out of fizz.org is New Mexico Mammoths Among Best Evidence for Early Humans in North America. So let's get into it. So bones from a mammoth butchering site record how humans shaped pieces of their long bones into disposable blades to break down the carcasses and rendered the fat over a fire. So that's a very bold statement. So as we get into this article, we're going to look at some of the details and kind of what this site looks like and way that, where they're getting these assumptions from. So it begins with a key de detail that sets this site apart uh, from this era. So in New Mexico, a place where most archaeological evidence uh, places the first human activity tens of thousands of years later, a recent study led by scientists with the University of Texas at Austin suggests that the site offers some of the most conclusive evidence for humans settling in North America much earlier than conventionally thought. The researchers revealed a wealth of evidence rarely found in one place. It includes fossils with blunt force fractures, bone flake knives with worn edges, and signs of controlled fire. And thanks to carbon dating analysis on collagen extracted from the mammoth bones, the site also comes with a settled age of 36,250 to 38,900 years old. That would make it the oldest known site left behind by ancient humans in North America. According to Timothy Rowe, a paleontologist and professor at the UT Jackson School of Geosciences, quote, what we've got is amazing. It's not a charismatic site with a beautiful skeleton laid out on its side, it's all busted up, but that's what the story is, end quote. Roe does not usually research mammoths or humans. He got involved because the bones showed up in his backyard, literally. A neighbor spotted a tusk weathering from a hill slope on Roe's New Mexico property back in 2013. When Roe went to investigate, he found a bashed-in mammoth skull and other bones that looked deliberately broken. It appeared to be a butchering site, but suspected early human sites are shrouded in uncertainty, and it can be notoriously difficult to determine what was shaped by nature versus human hands. Now, we've seen this sort of controversy before. Uh, here in the last few years, there's been a couple of these sites that have been found and discussed uh, with a lot of controversy surrounding those, even one pushing it back in San Diego to 130,000 years at the Cerruti site, which is certainly controversial controversial to say the least. So this uncertainty has led debate in the anthropological community about when humans first arrived here in North America. Although the mammoth site lacks clearly associated stone tools, Rowe and his co-authors discovered an array of supporting evidence by putting samples from the site through scientific analysis in the lab. Among other fine CT scans taken from the University of Texas High Resolution X-ray Computed Topography Facility, revealed bone flakes with microscopic fracture networks akin to those freshly napped cow bones and well-placed puncture wounds that would have helped in draining grease from ribs and vertebral bones. Quote, there are really a couple efficient ways to skin a cat, so to speak, Rose said. The butchering patterns are quite characteristic. In addition, chemical analysis of the sediment surrounding the bones showed that fire particles came from a sustained and controlled burn, not a lightning strike or a wildfire. The material also contained pulverized bone and burned remains of small animals, mostly fish, even though the site is over 200 feet above the nearest river. Also birds, rodents, and lizards. So based on genetic evidence from indigenous populations in South and Central America, the artifacts from the archaeological sites, some scientists have proposed that North America had at least two founding populations, the Clovis and a pre-Clovis society with a completely different genetic lineage. 
So that leads into a whole nother line of questioning when we start looking at different haplogroups, DNA evidence, and everything that surrounds that controversy. Now, with a site like this, much like the Saruti site, these things do not go uncontested. So I have it on good word that one of our recent guests here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal has commented on this, saying that there is another side to the story. At first, Rowe enlisted a prominent Southwest Paleo-Indian archaeologist to investigate the site. After the archaeologist determined that the artifacts were not associated and the remains are purely paleontological, Rowe vowed to find someone to continue per- to pursue the archaeological site and ended up publishing it himself. And none of the editors or reviewers of the article are North American archaeologists. Huh. So again, anytime these bold claims come to the forefront of the news and the media, there are certainly those who are watching them very closely from behind the scenes. Uh, again, that comment is from a guest that was recently on the show who I hold in very high regard and uh, certainly has a great reputation among modern paleo archaeologists. So here we are with another site. It's, you know, it's not clear cut like what we see with the Clovis Kill sites and scavenge sites. So we don't have the associated stone tools and artifacts that you would expect to see with something like this, but yet there seems to be some very interesting clues. So that's unfortunately where we'll have to leave this story. It is unsettled. It is certainly not confirmed at this point to be an actual kill site or scavenge site, but certainly much more research is going to have to be done. And I think if you're going to basically make it an anthropological archaeological site, it would you know behoove you to actually include some reputable archaeologists on the analysis of the site well certainly now you know the other side of that i guess just to play devil's advocate a bit is that i realize that when you have a very controversial idea or a story that seems to fall outside the expected paradigms it can be difficult to undergo peer review and to get you know corroboration from scientists who are working within that paradigm and so an example of something we've seen in you know fairly recent years, at least recent decades, has been some of the uh, purported Clovis sites and pre-Clovis sites down in northern Brazil and parts of South America, where, again, South American researchers are like, yeah, these are obviously pre-Clovis sites. North American archaeologists who are proponents of pre-Clovis often tend to kind of downplay those sites and have argued against their provenance as being earlier than Clovis. And I've wondered at times... You know, what exactly the nature of that dynamic is? Is it that the North American archaeologists are looking at the data differently and the data was misinterpreted maybe by South American archaeologists? And or are they looking at it with a particular bias, you know, favoring their own kind of claim to pre-Clovis sites and they don't want earlier, more famous sites to be found further south, which was indisputably the case, by the way, at Monte Verde. So again, you know, we have to kind of ask sometimes, do biases kind of filter in here? Now, in this case, what it sounds like, of course, is that somebody was going to, you know, no matter what it took, find somebody who seemed to share their view and publish that paper no matter what. That's not going to meet, you know, the demands of really good science. That's not going to satisfy people who are used to seeing peer review go, go through a very specific process, and there has to be a certain degree of control you know, in terms of how information is released. But by the same token, when you have something that is potentially game-changing, and really there have been a lot of similar discoveries to this, so I wouldn't see this one as necessarily being something that's going to rewrite the history books. It's a story that, like many others in recent years, would add to that narrative if verified. But again, it's sometimes hard to get those stories into print, so I can see both sides. At the end of the day, what it still comes back down to, and this is what you said, Jason, you have to have rigorous standards of evidence for it to be held true as science. That's just the simple fact, and that's what's going to have to be required. You're going to have to have that, and if you don't have that, it's going to remain interesting until proven otherwise, indisputably as being true or false. But in any case, of course, we always love to get into the debate about these things and to look at these stories, and of course, we'll have a little more later to say about that with our guest this week, but first, I do think... We should check in with our friends over there at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room. Jason, can you tell us what's been happening over there in Tennessee in recent days? Well, not much, actually, because Chase has not been in Tennessee. He has been out west once again for his annual summertime trip with his son, Isaac. And I think they broke the record this year. So they just returned back to the beautiful Smoky Mountains there in Tennessee 
after spending 48 days on the road, traveling through 27 different states and racking up 11,406 miles on the brand new Tundra Soar. So they've made it from the Mexican border to the Canadian border and everywhere in between fossils, dinosaurs, Pancho Villa going back to 1916. So they covered it all. Uh, you can find more on their social media. There's plenty of pictures that Chase has been posting both at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room as well as his personal uh, Facebook and Instagram. And they just really went all out this year. Again, you know, Isaac, such a fortunate young man to have a dad that takes him to do all these wonderful things. But after spending time with Chase on the road, I can also say that he is very fortunate to have a great son like Isaac, who enjoys spending that time with his dad out there on the road. Truly inspiring. Now, as far as the Smoky Mountain Relic Room goes, they have freshly stocked items like they always do. They just picked up a huge U.S. Uh, military surplus a group of helmets and other associated items, everything from World War II to the 1980s, M1 combat steel helmets. James, you've probably seen a few of those laying around in your day. And so they've got a lot of great military coming into the uh, site, plus everything that they picked up on the road. From what I understand, Chase says they have half, at least half of a 18-wheeler headed on pallets to, from out west toward the Great Smoky Mountains there in Sevierville, Tennessee, to the relic room inside the Smoky Mountain Knife Works. So lots of great new things, dinosaur bones, fossils, anything that you would want, plus the holidays are just around the corner. So we encourage you to head on over there to the Smoky Mountain Knife Works, head downstairs to the relic room. You'll find it right inside there. Chase is, if he's there, he'll be running around. He'll be happy to talk to you and answer your questions and show you all the new items. And of course, you can always find them at therelicroom.com. Again, TheRelicRoom.com, the largest diversity of history for sale in North America. And proud sponsors of the Seven Ages Audio Journal. We love Chase and the fine folks over there. They really do a lot to support our work, and that's very important. And, of course, you can also support our work by following us on Instagram, on Twitter. You can follow our work over at sevenages.org. Also, the Facebook group that Jason runs for the show. You can follow us and keep up to date with all the unique happenings in anthropology right there. And speaking of being on the road, just want to let everyone know that James and I will be heading out here in September. We're going to be meeting up in uh, the 16th of September over at Parkin Mounds. We've got a special tour lined up there uh, with some of the folks at Parkin. And we're going to record the fifth installment of our Mound Builder series there at the beautiful grounds, Parkin Mounds in Arkansas. And then on September 17th and 18th, we will be back at Pinson Mounds for their annual Archeo Fest. And so this is a big, big festival. They got a lot of things going on there. We're really happy to be a part of it. And we want to thank everybody there at Pinson for having us out. We are excited to meet the listeners and take part in the event. There's going to be all sorts of demonstrations, music, crafts, food. It's going to be a wonderful time over two days. Thousands of people are expected. So we've geared up. We've got merchandise. We've got plenty of things to hand out. We're very much looking forward to uh, speaking with everyone who comes by our tent and table. And it's going to be a great time there at Penson Mound, September 17th and 18th. Uh, again, we're hoping to meet some of our listeners out there. We do have our good friend Barry Anderson coming up from Florida, making a 13 hour trek just to be a part of the event. So thank you, Barry, for joining us there. And we're looking forward to meeting you all there. Archeo Fest at Penson Mound, September. 17th through the 18th indeed come out and support the team i won't unfortunately be able to be there for this one but i'll be there in spirit as always guys always supporting the work of the team and uh, i do hope eventually to be able to get back out there on the road with you one of these days as i would like to get down to some of these sites that we talk about some of these really interesting sites that are changing the way that we think about the ancient past one of those of course is one we've discussed in the past on this show that is galt Galt is unique because it was already a well-recognized Clovis site, but as we always recommend, digging deeper led to additional discoveries. And so in recent days, Jason caught up with the executive director there at the Galt School. That's Clark Wernicke. He's certainly somebody we should go and we should visit at some point, but he has some very interesting perspectives, not only on the Galt site, but also some of the recent developments, commentaries, and studies occurring in paleoanthropology right now. So let's dive right in with this conversation. Clark Wernicke awaits on the other side of this break. It is the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Dr. 
Dr. Clark Wernicke is the Executive Director for the Galt School of Archaeological Research. Dr. Wernicke brings a unique blend of scholarship and experience to the project with degrees in history, business, and anthropology. He has considerable experience in business and has specialized in the management of large archaeological projects. Dr. Wernicke has worked in the Middle East, Mesoamerica, the American Southeast, and Texas. In addition to his work with GSAR, he is currently working on archaeological data from the Mexican War and early Texas architecture. Dr. Wernicke, welcome to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Well, thank you for having me. Well, it's our pleasure. Uh, you know, we're excited for this interview. It's one that we've been wanting to do for quite a while. The Galt site is so renowned and revered within the world of archaeology. It's one of those sites that we've had a uh, limited interaction with in the past. We were able to talk to Dr. Bruce Bradley a little bit about the site and his role there, but it was part of a larger interview with him. And tonight we're excited to really be able to focus in on the site and give it its due diligence. So for those who may not be as familiar, let's begin with the location of Galt. Now, we're talking about Central Texas here, but what would have been attractive in the past to cultural groups to draw them into the Galt site? Well, that's a question that we get asked a lot. Uh, why there? Uh, when I first got there in 1999, it was 105 degrees. That was really very foremost on my mind. Why the heck would anyone live there? Right. But Galt is located about 40 miles north of Austin, uh, in central Texas. And first of all, it's on the edge of the Edwards Plateau, uh, which is soft, porous limestone. And the Edwards Plateau is where Texas gets most of its water. It's where four out of our uh, six major river systems start. It's where the 15 largest springs in Texas are. So it's a great big, giant, porous sponge filled with water. And that means there's a lot of water there and people need water. Sure. If you know, you're a hunter and gatherer, uh, you know, it'd certainly be easier if the animals come to you than uh, if you have to go and seek them out and they need water. And around the water are different kinds of plant materials, a lot of them usable and edible. And in the water, you've got fish and crawfish and shellfish and turtles. It's also an area that's known as an ecotone. An ecotone is where environmental uh, areas transition into one another. So a short distance away from Galt, we have the Blackland Prairie, the coastal plains. Galt is actually where the Balcones Canyonlands, the Edwards Plateau proper, and the Lampasas Cut Plains come together. So these four physiographic regions. And then the Creek Valley itself is a whole nother one. Uh, we tell people here it's you know kind of like living in an alley between two grocery stores, Lowe's and Home Depot. Right. Pretty much everything you could want is right there at your fingertips. Then on top of that, the Edwards Plateau, which is this ancient seabed, it's limestone, is one of the largest sources of chert, the material that people prefer to make uh, stone tools on. It's one of the largest sources in North America. It's 34,000 square miles of this stuff. And we wow. find Edwards Plateau chert more than 1,500 miles away archaeologically. So people are trading this. They're coming there for this. So you have food water, material, all these different things. And because of that, there's also active trade going through the area, which is, you know, goods from elsewhere as well as information from elsewhere. And put together, actually make it a really nice place, except for, you know, that one week in August when it's 114. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a great summation of the area. Again, that Edwards Plateau shirt, very popular in the world of flint napping, and certainly many, many beautiful artifacts have been made from that material. Now, before we return to the conversation, uh, before I want to kind of establish a little bit more about the Galt School of Archaeological Research, because that's also key to what's going on there. We're going to return uh, to the specifics about the Galt site here momentarily. But before we do so, tell us about the Galt School of Archaeological Research. What are the goals and what are your current projects? Uh, the Galt School of Archaeological Research is a 501c3 nonprofit that was formed in 2006, stemming from our work at Galt. Our original work at Galt was basically from 1999 through 2002. And looking at that, we decided that we had used uh, a lot of volunteers working at Galt, and we thought that we could further the goals that we had in research as well as pass on information about our research to the public 
through this nonprofit. So the Gold School is a nonprofit that does research and education regarding the earliest peoples in the Americas. And that involves several different things. I mean, there's the research end of it, which started at Galt and actually is continuing at Galt. Uh, we have had 16 master's theses and eight doctoral dissertations come out of the Galt materials alone. I have three graduate students working on theses and dissertations now. Wow. So we train students. Um, archaeology is an apprenticeship discipline. You, you know, if you're sent to school, and unfortunately most of the universities in the United States and Canada are still geared to turning out academics. Right. They're skill, you know, they're trying to teach people to teach. Sure. And once you graduate from school, unfortunately, that's not what employers want. They want to know what you can do, not what you can do, what you know. And there's a lot of practical skills. You know, we use a lot of physics and we use a lot of chemistry and we use a lot of geology and all these things uh, take a, a lot of knowledge and hands-on knowledge to be able to do anywhere from, you know, taking, a, you know, an electric, you know, doing electrical resistivity or, or taking uh, OSL samples or trying to get rock cores and things like that. You have to physically be able to do that. In addition, there's an outreach component to the community. Well, one of the reasons that archaeologists have such trouble raising money in the United States is because 90% of the people out there, probably even more than that, I'm being kind, have no idea what we do. Right. And that's our fault. Sure. Because we, you know, when we, when we finally write things, we write them in academies and we write them for the 10 other guys interested in what we're interested in. And I, I know lots of archaeologists that are, they just don't like talking to the public. So we have a, a very active outreach program that does tours of the Galt site and talks to groups and everything. And actually, since uh, 2009, when we started keeping track of it, we've spoken to over 65,000 people. Wow, that's incredible. That's a number I'm extremely proud of. Yeah, as you should be. That, yeah. That's great. So we have research, we have education, and we have outreach. Uh, as far as the research goes... You know, we, we still have stuff working that we're working on with Galt. Uh, right now, we have uh, materials from five Clovis sites in uh, western Kentucky in our lab from the Little River sites. Uh, we're actually just trying to inventory those and put them together so that other students and researchers can actually work on them. Uh, we did the lithic analysis for Monteverde. We did the lithic analysis oh, wow. for Waka Prieta in Peru. Um, so we work with other researchers on things they do that we might have more expertise in. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, we've, we've actually helped fund dates and other things at, at other sites. So we've worked on a site in Guatemala. We worked on some sites in Mexico uh, and in Belize. Uh, we've worked with other researchers here in the United States, helping them with their data. So some of our data gets sent out periodically or artifacts for other projects to work on. So, yeah, it's, it's a multi-component thing. It, it's, like I said, designed to continue research in the people of the Americas, and not just our research, helping others, assisting where we can, you know, that sort of thing, as well as educating that next generation of archaeologists and helping the public understand what we do. Well, those are all highly commendable things. And so you're almost like a hub, if you will, for passing along knowledge, taking in other sites, information, and data. And I'm sure also by doing that, it gives you the ability to see trends and see patterns from different places and kind of compare it to what you find there at Galt. So uh, looking at some of these other sites that you're drawing data from, are you seeing any similarities in what you find at Galt? And how does that help define the story of Galt? Well, when we're looking at, at the, uh, you know, well, 90% of our stuff is stuff that other people have basically seen. It's, it's a lot of stuff. We have 2.6 million artifacts from Galt from approximately 3% of the site. Wow. There are 22 archaeological cultures you can find in Central Texas. We have all 22. And then we have older stuff. And I'm guessing that's probably more than one culture because the dates we have are between, you know, uh, 14 and 18,000 years ago. I very much doubt that's all one culture. I just don't have a way to parse it out at Galt. Sure. So there's lots of different layers to Galt. And some of our theses and dissertations over the years 
have been by people pursuing things in the archaic or, you know, in the late Paleo-Indian, all the way up to looking at Clovis. We originally went to Galt because Mike Collins found Clovis there. Right. And Dr. Michael Collins is one of the world's leading experts on the on Clovis technology. So he was very excited. That's why we went there. We didn't expect to find any of the other things we found. Yeah, well, yeah, that's how it happens. And it's a wonderful thing when it does happen that way. So let's pick the conversation up there. Let's get into it. So let's talk about the history of Galt site. So before it was managed by the Galt School of Archaeological Research, let's talk about you know, those early days. So how long have people been finding artifacts and lithics and things on the site? And who were these people? So how far back does that go? Well, the, the earliest we know about is also the reason it's called the Galt site. Henry Galt uh, bought a number of properties out there to put together a farm in 1904 and bought some more land around it over, over the next five or six years. Uh, and Henry was not a very good farmer. Uh, the Edwards Plateau is a really poor place to farm. Most of the land that we have right now is basically got a half an inch of soil on top of bedrock. Uh, there's, some, there's some soil around the creek that you could actually farm, but that's a tiny proportion of Henry's farm. So Henry uh, found something he was good at. He'd uh, grown up out in that area. He knew the surrounding land and landowners well. And somehow he met the first archaeologist in Texas, a man named J.E. Pierce, who started the Department of Anthropology at the University of Texas. Now, J.E. Pierce was interested in something called a burned rock midden. Basically, it's a garbage heap from about six, 7,000 years old. We have a lot of those in Texas. J.E. Pierce was looking for burned rock middens to excavate. A after he met Henry... Henry had already served basically as an informer for several other guys who were interested in archaeology in Texas. Uh, Alex Deans, who was later president of the State Historical Association, was a, a prominent collector in Temple, Texas. Kenneth Ainsworth, whose uh, collection actually started the Texas collection at Baylor University, was a regent there. So he, he'd actually been telling these guys where they could find stuff, and they probably introduced him to peers. And Pierce would say, okay, I'm looking for something. And, you know, Henry would put his hand out and say, I might know of a spot. Uh, Jay Pierce would give him $10, which is a fortune in the 1920s. And Henry would introduce him to somebody else. We actually have an archaeological map that was owned by uh, Mr. Deanst. Uh, he had did it on an old soil map of Bell County. And there's little notes all the way around the margin that says, like, Henry says there might be. You know. So we know that Henry's talking to all these guys. Well, in 1929, J.E. Pierce went out to Henry's farm to look at sites there. I always tell people that he went out there, but all the pictures I have of J.E. Pierce are like white shoes, white pants, white shirt, straw boater, pointing. So I'm sure he was there a couple of times. But basically, he sent a handful of guys out to dig there for six weeks in the fall of 1929. They excavated on the site and brought stuff back to J.E. Pierce's office at UT, and he pronounced upon it at his desk. So that was the earliest archaeology in Texas and the earliest we know of the Galt site. During that time, for instance, as soon as Pierce had finished that, his friend Kenneth Ainsworth went down to the site in 1930 and said that when he went down there, there were a couple of guys who jumped the fence who were digging holes. So okay. uh, we also know there was looting during those years as well. Sure. Uh, I've interviewed some guys who, who mentioned that, yeah, well, in the 1950s, I jumped the fence. So, you know. There right. was a lot of that. So there's about 90 years of looting and collecting. Henry sold the site in the 1940s. The new landowners actually started a pay-to-dig site. Started out at $2, ended up at about $25 to dig a hole and keep what you found. And that went until basically 1998 when the land changed hands again. And the new landowners ended the pay-to-dig site. They were trying to clean up as best they could out there, fill in all these big craters that people had dug across the burn rack middens on the site. And they found something they thought was really important. And it actually turned out to be the lower mandible of a juvenile female Colombian mammoth. Oh, wow. But it wasn't old enough to be a fossil. It wasn't young enough to be bone. It was like wet toilet paper. So they did what every good Texas rancher does. They called around to say, who can we trust? 
because they all believe we have superpowers and we can take artifacts or land away from people. Right. And they ended up talking to Mike Collins. Mike Collins came out and talked to him, and they said, hey, he's one of us. Mike has a big ranch, so he speaks fluent rancher. He doesn't speak academies. So he spoke to him. They liked him. He showed them what they'd found. And what Mike saw was more Clovis Age artifacts than he'd seen before in his life scattered around. Wow. And he got pretty excited. I imagine so. <laughs> so 90 years of looting and collecting out there. Um, you know, some legitimate, some illegitimate. I've interviewed a lot of the collectors and looked at a lot of this, uh, of their collections. It, it's really interesting just to see what kind of stuff left the site over all those years. Sure. Most of these guys knew that the population of the New World had been increasing exponentially until the arrival of the Spanish. So if you dig a big, wide hole in the upper stuff, you go home with a shoebox full of artifacts for 25 bucks. If you dig a deep, narrow hole, you may go home with nothing. Right. So for those two reasons, they, in effect, protected the lower archaeology. They Makes just sense. dug these great big holes about three feet deep, and they went through a lot of this stuff from the last 8,000 years, but they didn't go into the lower stuff. And how deep is the lower stuff in the, in the stratigraphy? Well, the deepest part of the site is about 13 to 14 feet deep. Wow. Yeah, it's a lot deeper than I expected. <laughs> so yeah. certainly no one was going that deep. No, the, the first mile or so of Buttermilk Creek is almost flat. It has very little slope. And it's a fairly wide valley right at the head of the creek. In fact, upstream from where we were working, about 500 yards, is a spring that starts the creek. And so water comes rushing out all these ravines and from the catchment area. It gets into this wider valley. It spreads out. It slows down. And it drops most of what it's carrying. So in this wide area where people were living in the past, Every time we got sheet wash and overbank deposits and even the aeolian stuff being blown in there, spread out in this valley and kept sealing contexts over the last 20,000 years. Right. So if you go a mile downstream from us, there's really no soil in the valley at all. It starts picking up slope and it's just scoured down to bedrock. Hmm. So we're kind of lucky geologically that Galt is there. So... I mean, it's primarily a karst topography, but is there a lot of like sinking streams and caverns and, you know, solution channels and that kind of thing in the area or more downstream? They, there are. I mean, Galt actually goes underground, not uh, far south of us in the, the dry years. Mm-hmm. In the wet year, it'll run on the surface. But in the dry years, I know we'll have running water where we are, but then it darts under, on, you know, underground oh, probably less than a mile. Uh, downstream from us. There are karstic features. There are sinkholes and things like that. Uh, At Galt, we have several old broken off rock shelters. Because of the humidity from the Gulf, from the Gulf, our geology doesn't stand up well to time. Dr. Collins actually did an article many years ago, looking at the geology of the Perigord in Southern France and the geology of the Edwards Plateau. And they're very similar except that the caves and rock shelters there are 20,000 some years old. Ours are usually less than 8,000. Okay. So 20,000 years ago, what was the climate like in that part of the world? All depends on the year. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you know, sometimes it was wet. Sometimes it was dry. Sometimes it was hot. Sometimes it was cold. We have rough environmental curves for, the, you know, early Texas for, for the late Pleistocene and early Holocene. Uh, they're based on, on bog cores. They're not as well-defined as we'd like because at the time, well, dating was more expensive and wasn't as refined as it is now. Uh, it's one of the projects we've had on the burners for a long time that we'd like to do bog cores and get a date like every 10 centimeters so that you could start to better define that. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I get asked that a lot, and it's like, well, it depends. I mean, when you start, for instance, uh, with people in the Clovis culture in Texas, it's actually cooler and wetter. But by the end of that period, we're starting a major drought here. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting how it, it pans out that way. Now, from the reading that I've done on the site, having never been there myself, it appears that there are, within that, 
exclusive region that you described, there's several sites archaeologically, but as far as the Galt site goes, how big is the actual site that's considered Galt? Oh, boy. Um, we've tried, uh, we've, we've done soundings both upstream and downstream to try and figure that out. And I know they say there are multiple sites, meaning, uh, shall we say the Deborah L. Friedkin site was on your mind? Yes, that was it's the one I was thinking of. Yards downstream, and as far as I'm concerned, it's the lower edge of Galt. Okay. Because we've tested the property in between it, and there's pretty much continuous artifacts. Okay, so it's an extension uh, of the Galt, most likely. Yeah, it goes it goes a good three, 400 yards downstream and probably about 200 yards upstream. The site itself may be as much as 30 acres. Okay, so it's significant. We have the, we have the central part of it. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about this. You've described the depth of 13 to 14 feet of really going down. And we've talked a little bit about the geology of the area, but when we're talking about something that deep, give us kind of an idea of the stratigraphic description. It looks, from what I can tell from pictures and videos, it looks very difficult to move through that terrain, especially to that depth. But what exactly are you dealing with as far as the uh, stratigraphy yeah. goes? Well, I mean, uh, the large area that we dug called Area 15, where we uh, found the, the stuff that's really old, is uh, first of all got a midden on top of it, a great big huge burned rock midden. So it's a lot of fist sized burned limestone and a lot of garbage from about 7,000 years till probably about two or 3,000 years ago. In fact, uh, the midden there in the valley is one of the largest ones I know of in central Texas. It's about 800 feet long, 100 feet wide, and it used to be about six feet tall. Now it's probably about three feet tall as you look at it. So there's that. Then you go underneath that, and there's a lot more middle and early archaic. The soil itself, uh, the midden itself is organic. It's all, the, it's all this garbage over time. It's the remains of what they ate and what they cooked and, and all this. But it's also intermixed with lots and lots of napping debris because we have this, these large sources of material nearby. The record's actually held by a unit near the surface in Area 15. We're in a 10-centimeter one-by-one. We had 16,683 flakes and tools. Wow. And we tell people everything larger than a quarter, we got its exact position on Earth with a laser system. And then you write and map that on about 15 pieces of paper, and then you get a camera and you take a picture of it and you put it in a bag. It took the two young ladies digging this sad one by one about two months oh, to wow. dig down four inches. And I learned new words from them. I didn't think they knew. Um, <laughs> it was tough. Once you get underneath the midden, you get into the clays of the valley. That's what that broken down limestone is. And Texas clay only has two states. It's either soup or cement. Yeah. I actually started a unit with a hammer and chisel in one place. Wow. So you had to wet it down to be able to, you know, to dig it properly because you're scraping very slowly. Sure. Yeah, I was uh, I was looking at the photos and it, you know, obviously looks like clay. And Jason, oh. if, you, if you've never done any digging in clay, the, the, I'm telling you, Southeast archaeology is kind of spoiled because there's a lot of sand. Oh, it's yeah. super easy oh, to man. dig in. I've dug all man. over the world. I've dug clay. in a lot of sandy loam. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, uh, our field director runs a field school in the summer in, in New York State. And he always comes back with these pictures uh, of these longhouses and you see post molds and everything. And we tell them that's not real archaeology because they just scrape it off, you know, and there it is. Um, this stuff is really hard and it's harder than anything I've had to deal with before. Uh, it is tough. The very uppermost stuff, you actually soak everything in a bucket, uh, ideally overnight some of these we actually had to use a defloculant. Uh, we actually use a chemical that breaks the clay down before you screen it through multiple levels of screen. So it's a bear. As you get down deeper, it becomes easier. First of all, because we have a highly fluctuating water table here in Central Texas. So the stuff is damper. It's easier to dig, you, you know. You take it over to the wet screens, you top the bucket off with water, you wait about 20 minutes, it turns into a fine silt. You can pour it through the screens. 
So it gets easier as you go down. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, the other thing is, is that we do microscopic use wear on a lot of tools. And since steel is softer than chert, I can't use trowels and the usual things around stone tools. If you have 16,000 pieces of debitage and, and tools in a, in a unit, there goes all your best digging tools. So most of that hole was dug with bamboo splinters, chopsticks, and these little tiny nylon artist palette knives, wow. which <laughs> is why every one time somebody you know, will ask me and say, why did it take like eight years to get to the bottom? Well, well that's why. I mean, we were working six days a week with lots of volunteers, but you can only dig so fast when you're using chopsticks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That's I had no idea. That is incredible. So am I to believe, would it make sense that type of clay, is that better for preservation of artifacts? It's really poor for preservation of anything organic. Sure. In fact, a lot of places in Galt, we have absolutely no pollen. We have areas with no phytoliths. We have no areas with diatoms. I mean, we, we keep looking for this stuff that we thought would be indestructible, and we find little of that. Mm. Uh, we've had some people process immense quantities of dirt to get a little bit of damaged starch grains. You know, it's just, there's just not much. So we, we get bone fragments, okay. but there's a big section of the site, and we get very little bone. We get lots of great stone tools. Sure. But, yeah, we lose a lot of other things. Well, yeah, you know, it's always those perishables that are, are really interesting that help paint the picture of the story. And I can imagine if you were finding that dense concentration of lithic material, what the perishables must have been on the site at one yeah. point. You know, it would have been absolutely well, incredible. So how deep in that stratigraphy are you going down before you get to Clovis artifacts? Clovis is, what, in Area 15? It's different in different parts of the site. In fact, on one side of the stream, the geology is slightly different than on the other side of the stream. And on one end of our north pasture, it's quite different than the other end of the north pasture. Uh, you know, the, the bedrock fluctuates. There's different depths of soils in different places. But in Area 15, uh, it's uh, almost two meters down when you get to Clovis. So I'm looking at a, at a photo of a Area 15 with a yeah. with a cross section with some figures on it and talking it's about where Clovis is. Stripe. Yeah, so it looks like below Clovis, maybe 30 or 40 centimeters. It's you're right on top of the limestone bedrock, and then above that pre-Clovis horizon, there's a sterile zone. What is the sterile zone? It's it's not completely sterile. I mean, I I think that, and I know since we've been working on the monograph that everybody's trying to get away from calling it that. No matter what you do, no matter what kind of geology there is, there's going to be a little bit of stuff that moves through the soil. Uh, in there, it's very small stuff. Uh, not not The large stuff stays put, but there is very small stuff. So it's not completely sterile, but it has very little in it compared to above it or below it. You know, it's that break between cultural zones you see that, Suggest yeah. that for a while there, there was nobody at Galt, you know, and stuff got sealed up, and then it was a while before someone else showed up there. E even when we look at Clovis, there's suggestions that there were at least, and archaeologically, it's hard to say this, but two or three major episodes of Clovis uh, technology there, where people using Clovis technology came by there, which... I tell people, you know, if you took a time machine and you could go back in time, if you picked a day to go, chances are there'd be nobody there. I mean, archaeologically, we can't define it that simply. But, for instance, uh, at Area 8, which is actually on the uh, south side of Buttermilk Creek uh, from where Area 15 is, uh, that one it was actually, we excavated there for years. That's where the mammoth mandible was found. And Texas A&M actually worked there for two seasons and wrote a book about it, uh, and they appear to have, at the bottom of it, Clovis with mammoth, horse, and bison, and at the top of that level where we have Clovis diagnostics, we just have bison. Interesting. I mean, yeah. it, it's an interesting data point, and it doesn't prove anything, but it suggests that you're spanning extinction events, or at least locally, that sure. maybe some of these other critters aren't around anymore. And you right. just have bison. 
Yeah, and that would be in keeping with many other sites that we've seen in various yeah. parts of the country. So that would make perfect sense. We don't have other sites like Galt so far in Central Texas. So, you know, coming up with patterns locally is difficult. Sure. Well, it's interesting, though, that it seems that you guys have approached, you know, this from multiple angles and tried every effort to get as much clear data as you can. But the way that you describe that, you know, people not necessarily there year round, but again, we're talking hunter gatherers, people moving through the area would have been a good pit stop for a few days or even a few weeks. Again, it's it's what kind of draws you into this particular site because it does represent such a huge swath of time. And like you said, 22 cultures, every one of those that's present in Texas is present at this site. But I know uh, my personal interest on the site tends to go back to the Clovis and potentially pre-Clovis items that are found there. So let's talk a little bit about some of the artifacts that are coming from the Galt site during that Clovis and earlier than Clovis time period. So there have been what you would expect to find your normal debutage, your Clovis points and those type of things. But Galt boasts some very, very unique finds such as the incised stones. I can't, right off the top of my head, I can't think of any other Clovis site that represents something so unique. So tell us a little bit about the discovery of those stones and what exactly they seem to portray. There, there may be some others elsewhere. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, Joe Gingrich sent me one from Shawnee Minisink that looks to me like an incised stone. One of the problems that you have with incised stones, and uh, Dr. Ashley Lemke and I wrote an article some years back in uh, American Antiquity about it, was if you don't look for them, you won't find them. And that sounds very simplistic and sometimes a little stupid, but actually it was interesting because it was quoted in the articles that were coming from Trinil, Indonesia, where they have paired zigzags on shells 450,000 years old. And they said, just like Dr. Lemke and Dr. Wernicke said, if you don't look for it, you won't find it. A lot of this stuff is really easy to look right past. The first incised stones found at Galt were found by a collector, David Olmsted, in the 1980s and brought to our attention in uh, 1991. And David took Mike Collins and Dr. Tom Hester out there to show them where he'd found them. And there was this hole, you know, another big three-foot-wide crater with a bunch of piles of dirt around it. Tom Hester and Mike Collins found four incised stones in his back dirt that day, and they weren't sifting it. They were just poking around that he hadn't noticed. Wow. Because you really got to start looking for them. And once you start looking for them, then son of a gun, they start kind of jumping out at you. I I liken it to uh, a lot of my career. I've worked on sites that have ceramics or architecture. And, you know, you learn to spot a ceramic shirt 40 feet away. Right. You just to get that in your head. And I'm no good at it with lithics. But I've been out of the site with collectors who point 30 feet away in the grass and go, hey, is that a projectile point base? And I'll go, I can't even see that far. What the heck are you looking at? <laughs> yeah. Once you start looking for those incised stones, we started finding them, and including I had some folks working out of Galt that uh, I won't mention their names, but they were professionals. And they denied that there was any such thing. And they found three in their excavation. Uh-huh. So it was like, yeah. And we have them throughout time at Galt. There's a handful that are Clovis, but we have them throughout time. And incised stones like that are found on every continent on Earth except Antarctica. We find them going back 450,000 years to pre-human hominids at Trinil. We find them in Africa. We find them in Europe. We've, We find them in the United States all over in the Archaic and Late Paleo-Indian. You can find them in the Sacramento River Valley in California. You can find them in Nevada. You can find them in Alaska. So I can't tell you why people did this, but I can tell you that particularly when you're looking at the geometric designs on a lot of them, it's something that all human beings share. Right. Children about the age of two start drawing the same things unaided. Sure. It's actually part of the software, your frontal cortex. Yes, and that's what I find so interesting about it. Uh, So when we're talking about these incised stones, what are they carved into? Is it on limestone? They are carved either into the calcium carbonate in the outside of chert or they're carved into limestone, which really they're both the same 
kind of substance, although the calcium sure. carbonate crust on the outside of chert nodules is softer than, generally than the local limestone. Yeah, so I was going to ask about that because I'm looking at a you know a close up picture of one of the incised stones, and it looks like it actually has some kind of other coating on it other than chert, and that's what the obviously make out the lines and the designs or some zigzag yeah, designs. Looking at the one I'm thinking, yeah, I, there's some calcium carbonate on the outside of those, and that's a problem. I had a lot of people saying, well, you should just take that off and say, look, um, I've got a pedogenic calcium carbonate on top of a marine calcium carbonate. They're basically yes. the same things. No matter what I use to try and remove one, it'll remove the other. Right, the right. The oldest so, ones we find at Galt tend to be on chert cortex. And they stand out really nicely because when you carve through that white cortex and the gray or brown or yellow or whatever of the chert shows through, they're really, you know, they're really uh, eye-catching. You can see them very clearly. But we do find some carved into limestone. The ones we find later on tend to be on limestone, but we do find some on chert cortex. Really two completely different behaviors, if you think about it. The ones on chert are carved on chert nodules that are later broken up. The ones on limestone are all on complete, small, flat limestone rocks. They're not broken. They're not, you know, they're not incomplete. That's really, that's really interesting. So the ones that are on chert, did they later on reacquire us, you know, a thin coating of calcium carbonate? Uh, just yeah, from being in, in the, the ground, they get, they get some uh, calcium carbonate in the ground, okay. yeah. Okay. The, the pedogenic calcium carbonate. So some of them are a little obscured by that. Right, the, okay. The, the interesting thing about that is ethnographically, uh, I've collected what we like to call uh, one true reasons because somebody eventually gets so enamored of the idea they have, they write an article and say, this is what they all are. And I've collected 70 one true reasons. <laughs> and ethnographically, we've seen them used everywhere from graffiti to gaming stones to sacred healing stones. The, the interesting thing to me is not what they were used for, because I can't determine that. There's no way for me. I can come up with lots of hypotheses. I, I've done a several papers with the International Federation of Rock Art Organizations, and they, they, especially the guys with the art history background are like, well, it could be this or it could be that. And I don't really care because there's no way to test any of those. So it's a waste of my time to keep speculating about it. Yeah. The really cool thing is, Everywhere on earth you find these things. You find them in China, you find them in Russia, you find them in Europe, you find them in Africa, you find them on islands in the Pacific, you know, and different cultures are giving them different reasons once they put, you know, something on that rock. But it's something we all share as humans. I tell you this, that whoever did it was probably young because you had to have some pretty good near vision to be able to see that. <laughs> well, and some really, really good hands. Yes. I have tried to do some. And one of the problems, whether you're – the short ones are a little easier to do, I would say. But trying to do that on limestone, limestone's got these little inclusions in it. You know, there'll be a little hard nugget of quartz or feldspar or something in there. And when you look at these things, almost all of them have paired lines. There are two lines parallel to each other, very close together. And then there's usually a larger space and two lines close together. So we get – grids and herring bones. We get, you know, the two lines together with paired zigzags in between them. Trying to do a straight line with a chert flake is nearly impossible, at least for me. You know, I'll get about halfway across and that flake will jump because it'll hit something hard. And when you look at these, they're just these wonderfully straight lines and these designs. The one we have with the paired zigzags on it, which is probably not Paleo Indian, it's probably archaic. We don't have really good provenience for that one, but it's one of my favorites. But I tried to trace that design to show people in a PowerPoint slide because it's hard to see the design on limestone. It kind of washes out. And you have to go up to the top line and then short of the bottom line, then up to the top line and short of the bottom line with the zigzag, and then do the opposite with the next one. And for some reason, it's near impossible for me to do. I would screw up after about, you know, the fourth zig. And right. you'd go, well, come on. I look at that stone. There isn't a single mistake. There are no lines crossing each other. There are no lines that go outside those lines. Somebody had a very, very sure hand and a very sure eye. And most of these things are just thrown out afterwards. 
So whatever reason they had for making it originally is pretty ephemeral. Is there any instance in which any of them have been drilled or anything that would indicate that they were worn in any type of way, or they just seem to have been maybe made around the campfire and just left? No, I have. I, 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 we included in the collection, but I don't really regard it the same as an inside stone. We actually have a small disc that's broken where it had a drilled hole that's probably archaic that looks just like that little one from Lindenmeyer. If you've ever seen, it's really, really thin, and the edge of it is scored like the edge of a quarter. Right. You know, little yeah. lines all the way around. And that's the only one that I've seen that, you know, probably was part of a gorget or hung on a, a thong or whatever. But most of these, no. In fact, most of them would be a little heavy to be wearing around your neck. Sure. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. The one with the zigzags on it is about the size of my hand. Right. And about an inch thick. <laughs> it's, that's a pretty big decoration. You know, it, it kind of leads me down this thought, and a lot of people have asked me about this, and I don't have the answer, but uh, we'll take a swing at it here. Why does it seem that, Clovis seems to be missing artwork so much. Like people have always asked me, you know, the lithic itself is an art, but you know, that was probably done for more practical reasons. But why do we, in your opinion, why do we seem to be missing art with alongside Clovis finds? Well, first of all, maybe a lot of it's perishable. True. If you look at, for instance, the stuff from Mosilla river, they have the you know this bone rod with paired zigzags just like my paired zigzags. There was a find many many years ago that was kind of dismissed from a place called Jacob's Cavern in uh, Missouri. Uh, it was dismissed because somebody said it looked like a rhinoceros and there weren't rhinoceri there, so therefore it's wrong. But everyone I've showed it to says sure looks like a mammoth or a mastodon to me. But right next to it is a paired zigzag on this bone. Unfortunately, the American Museum of Natural History can't find it in their collections for us to look at it again. But, uh, you know, we have tantalizing clues that there may have been a lot of this stuff on bone. Maybe it was on hide. Maybe it was on their skin. True. We find a lot of things. In fact, we, we have one from Galt, and I know I've seen them from other sites, that tested positive for human blood on them that may be scarifiers or tattooing instruments. Absolutely. Right? Sure. So, and, and when you look at, you know, people are hung up on cave art, which if you're going to blindly accept that everybody came from, you know, one part of, uh, of Siberia, I, I don't know of a lot of caves in Western Siberia with cave art. So it's funny that the people that get hung up on that are usually anti anyone coming from Europe, but then they keep hearkening back to cave art from Europe. But the fact is, is if you look at things, like Mike Collins' article about the geology of the Edwards Plateau, our caves and rock shelters aren't old enough. If there was stuff there, they're gone. Right. They're destroyed. I, you know, there's all these articles uh, right now about Cosquer Cave in, in France and rising sea levels. Right? Here's this cave that was discovered practically by a miracle because the entrance is well underwater, but now it may be destroyed by the fact that the seas are rising again. Right. Maybe some of the stuff's just gone. Yeah. But I, I still expect somebody will find it. Sure. Yeah. I mean, there's always that possibility out there. We are speaking with Dr. Clark Warnicky. He is the executive director for the Galt School of Archaeological Research. And let's pick up the conversation with the mammoth remains. Now, you mentioned this earlier. There was the juvenile Colombian mammoth. I think that's just one more of the wonderful mysteries of the Galt site. So let's learn a little bit more about that particular discovery, because I understand there are quite a few butchering tools that were found along with that mammoth. So uh, what area of the stratigraphy was that found? What time period is it dated to? And what do we know about it? Well, Galt has been a bunch of surprises. I told you we, we came there to look for Clovis, because that's what Mike saw. And, and we got these incised stones. And the oldest incised stones that we have are representative of the oldest art in the Americas, which is a pretty big surprise. And then we got, uh, you know, 2.6 million artifacts from about 3% of the site. It's a pretty big surprise. Most sites have significantly less data. So when the, the landowners found this thing, um, it wasn't old enough to be a fossil. It wasn't young enough to be bone. It was like wet toilet paper. So we actually got a famous paleontologist to help us. Dr. Ernie Lundelius is actually a emeritus professor at UT's Vertebrae Paleontology Lab. And they came out to help us cast this thing and get it out of the ground 
so that we could harden it and preserve it. And when they were excavating around it, getting the mud and water away from it, they found a flake, an expedient tool that had been resharpened several times right near it. Ernie was pretty excited because uh, he's worked on sites with signs of early man, but finding a tool right there with some of the bones he's interested in is pretty exciting. As they're clearing that mud away, they also found a Clovis point. So in the final excavations around the mandible, and there's a shoulder blade and a couple other little bits, we have 22 butchering tools and a Clovis point. Now, I will say that even in the golf school, we've gone out of our way to bring in staff members that don't agree with each other. Sure. We like different, uh, uh, you know, uh, different ideas and different points of view. Uh, but, uh, and I know all, not all of my colleagues agree with me. But I look at this stuff. Those bones have not traveled very far. Uh, and the tools, all of them are sharp. None of them are tumbled or anything else. To me, that says Clovis kill site. And I've had no problems with telling people I believe it's a Clovis kill site. Or at the very least, if you don't believe they were killing them all the time, a Clovis butchering site. Right. But I, I think with dire wolves and saber-toothed tigers and short-faced bears in the area, I don't think they're scavenging anything. <laughs> sure. Uh, I think they killed that thing. Right. Uh, there's a, a water hole right next to it that we know people have been using for some time. Uh, there's actually a pavement around that water hole where people had stuck stones through two different strata of clay to try and get a dry area to get to the water. And next to it is a Clovis age well. Hmm. Uh, at the end of the Clovis period, we're starting a major drought here. Apparently, people knew exactly where those springs should be, so they're just following the water table down and digging this hole. So people have been using that water hole. So it doesn't surprise me that somebody comes up valley and there's a juvenile mammoth there and they say, what the heck? I think we can take it. And I got this cool idea. I'm thinking of calling barbecue, you know, yeah. And here in Texas, we think that's a hell of a big brisket. Yeah. Yeah. That may be where uh, Texas barbecue got its start. <laughs> I would say so. Yeah. It makes perfect sense. Now we mentioned, or you mentioned that the bones didn't travel very far, but was the, 22 tools in the Clovis point. Was that made of the local Edwards plateau chert as yeah. well? Okay. Yeah, there's almost no exotics at Galt. Um, the uh, original find that David Olmstead found of these two incised stones with an alabates Clovis point in it, in between them, that alabates point, uh, alabates is from alabates national monument, about 400 miles away near Amarillo, Texas. That's one of the few exotics we have at Galt at all. Now, that doesn't mean that folks there didn't have them. It's just that Galt is a huge manufacturing site. You don't bring out your good cutlery when you're at a manufacturing site. Sure. Well, if they had exotic materials, they probably kept those in the you know with them and took them when they left. They're yeah. there to retool. Yeah, they had those tucked away somewhere special. Yeah. So uh, that's fascinating. And again, Galt has produced so many interesting and anomalous things. Now, one of the other parts that I was reading about that I've always thought was just paramount to the site. And one of the most unique things that I've seen on any site is this stone floor discovery. So when we say stone floor, give us a, a good detailed description of exactly what that means and how it was discovered and at what time period it's uh, associated with. They say that we only have this stone floor because I'm interested in architecture, um, <laughs> but uh, that's not entirely true. Uh, Basically, we had done some tests in one area. Uh, we had a Texas Archaeological Field School out there. It ended with a huge flood. And uh, there was quite a mess, very shallow units. They didn't get very far, but they were all filled with mud. So we started cleaning them out and digging down in this one area. And we found basically a straight line of rocks in the clay that ran north-south. And there's a lot of reasons that can happen in nature but we started to open up units around it just to check. And the rocks turned a right-hand corner to the south of that line, and they turned a right-hand corner to the north of that line. So basically, we dug in the same place for two years, took everything down very gently to that level. And what we had was uh, a floor made out of gravels that's a little over seven feet square and about four inches thick. And it's pretty distinctively square with clay all around it. 
And it doesn't really surprise me. Uh, you know, when we're talking about that Texas clay, well, the big thing about clay is it wicks water up. Yeah. And we have a lot of water out there. The only reason we were able to dig Area 15 was because Texas actually entered a major drought. And even then, we had seven pumps working 24-7 to keep it dry. Mm. So if you're going to camp out there, you're going to want to get up off the clay. But there were artifacts on top of it and around one side of it to the north side of it. There was a whole bunch of burnt artifacts, uh, which got more and more burnt as you went east of it. And to the southwest of it, there was a whole bunch of faunal material, bits and pieces of bone. Uh, these and a number of other things, when you look at it, kind of tells me this has a front and a back. Right. It's got structure on it, garbage out back. Somebody's napping up front. There's a fire out to the east. You, you can see that pretty clearly when you look at it. And the dates we get out there are at least of Clovis age, perhaps even a little older. The, 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 the tools that we have there, I know were originally thought to be Clovis, and there's some thought that they might actually come from a little bit prior to that. There's, there's not a Clovis point or anything that you can point at. There's things like blade segments and things like that. And since we started finding a lot of those in the pre-Clovis thing, we started rethinking it. And like I said, the dates are a little older than Clovis, which with error could put it there. Sure. But even if you just decide that's of Clovis age, somebody built a hut in the woods, went down to the creek, got basket loads of gravel, nothing too big, nothing too small, nothing sharp, and poured them inside there to get up off the clay. That's not something you do if you're there overnight. Right. These are not highly migratory big game hunters. These are broad spectrum hunters and gatherers, What something that most of us knew for a long time. I don't think ethnographically in the history of the world anyone's ever documented a big game hunting culture. Uh, I was looking for something the other day for a class, and it's interesting because when you look for big game hunting traditions online, Wikipedia says, well, the archetypes are Clovis and Folsom. When you look at Clovis, it says look to Folsom. When you look at Folsom, it says look to Clovis. So there's a lot of circular reasoning there going right. on. But the fact is... Nobody can subsist on just big animals. Sure. Makes They're sense. eating everything. Nobody's crossing Buttermilk Creek, you know, uh, 13,000 years ago and going, hey, look at those turtles. What a shame I only eat mammoth. <laughs> right. Yes. And so turtle is something that's found on a lot of Clovis sites. We find burned turtle to bone and carapace on a lot of them because, for God's sakes, it's the original fast food. It comes in its own bowl. Absolutely. And a five-year-old can pick up a turtle. Yes, yeah. this is you true. Yeah. Your family. Yeah, yeah. Low, you know, low danger. Big game is it's dicey. I mean, that's dangerous well, work, yeah, right? Dangerous, and people did it. Certainly, we have proof of that, but they don't seem to have done it very often. Yeah, and so I'm taking it that you're not a fan of the overkill hypothesis. <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense, All right? Yeah, you know, if you look, the big elephant count uh, took place two years ago. We kill almost 60,000 elephants a year today. There's 140,000 elephants in Botswana alone. We kill 60,000. We have what? Uh, Gary Haynes has been working on a paper there that he's got online that's uh, in progress that he says worldwide he's found about 120 that you could say might be mammoth kill sites. And that's, you know, a lot of those nobody will agree on because there just isn't enough proof. But anything that even had an inkling that might be 120. And, you know, who's killing the glyptodonts? Right. <laughs> and, and who's killing the pterotorns? That's my favorite. You got a carnivorous bird with a 24-foot wingspan, and we're all Slim Jims. So we're saying an Asian biker gang with some kind of uh, anti-aircraft weapon came to the New World and killed all the pterotorns? It doesn't make sense. Territorns could eat deer. They could eat bison. They could eat anything. They're a big carnivorous bird. They could eat us. Right. Even going to, you know, well, this is a keystone thing, and this species died out, so all the other ones died out. I'm not buying it. And we do have some evidence recently. There's just a recent article about some evidence for mammoths in the Yukon 5,000 years ago. We already know there were 8,000 years ago in the Channel Islands and Wrangell Island. 
Right. Yeah. So they were around a lot longer than we thought. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. We've always spoken of them as going extinct 10,000 years ago. Like everybody woke up on a Tuesday and food was gone. Right. Yeah. This would have been a slow, gradual oh. process. We now know that people live for perhaps as long as 30,000 years side by side with megafauna in Australia. Right. I'm sure they were hunting them. They didn't kill them all. No. It would have been tough. No, absolutely not. So one of the more, uh, including that, but not only the overkill hypothesis, but another GALT-specific area of discussion that seems to come up quite often is, is there pre-Clovis there or earlier than Clovis? And if so, by how much and how do you determine that? Sure. And uh, I know it's a controversial subject or at least the media portrays it that way. Right. Because even if you go back 10 years ago when the SAA did a little uh, straw poll, they found that 65% of the archaeologists who knew anything about it believed in pre Clovis. If you go back before that, you'll find there was an awful lot of people who thought that it never made any sense. You know, it just doesn't fit the data and it never had. So there's still a handful of people that are very loud. <laughs> They uh, have better press offices than I have, I guess, that make these noises about every site that comes up. And some of them probably are questionable. I'm not saying that every site that has old dates is definitely true. But I'd say there's so many now, there's enough smoke that you got to place your bet on the fact that there's a fire there somewhere. Right. That's a great point. And with that, I do want to bring up a recent paper that came out in April of 2022. Uh, And I want to bring this to your attention. I know you're aware of it, but I do want to get it in the discussion here tonight because I think that it's an important point uh, because these earlier than Clovis and pre-Clovis sites continue to be hotly debated internationally and here in North America. So this new paper out of the University of Wyoming titled UW led study challenges theories of earlier human arrival in America. So this new analysis of archaeological sites in the Americas challenges relatively new theories that the earliest human inhabitants of North America arrived before the migration of people from Asia across the Bering Strait. So this was conducted by the University of Wyoming, Professor Todd Suravel, and colleagues from UW and five other institutions. The analysis suggests that misinterpretation of archaeological evidence at certain sites in North America and South America might be responsible for theories that humans arrived long before 13,000 to 14,200 years ago. The researchers' findings appeared in the PLOS One journal, And the paper is the latest development in the debate over the peopling of America. So the conclusions of Cervell and his colleagues are based on an analysis of buried archaeological deposits using a new statistic called the Apparent Stratigraphic Integrity Index that they developed. While the stratigraphic integrity of early archaeological sites in Alaska is high, producing strong evidence in support of unambiguous human occupation, The sites in more southern locations pointing to possible earlier human occupations show signs of artifact mixing among multiple time periods. Quote, if humans managed to breach the continental ice sheet significantly before 13,000 years ago, there should be clear evidence for it in the form of at least some stratigraphically discrete archaeological components with a relatively high artifact count. So far, no such evidence exists, Surville and colleagues wrote. Again, our findings support the hypothesis. The first human arrival in the New World occurred by at least 14,200 years ago in Beringia and by approximately 13,000 years ago in the temperate latitudes of North America. Strong evidence for human presence before those dates has yet to be identified in the archaeological record. Specifically, the new analysis compared the stratigraphic integrity of three sites argued to contain evidence of earlier human occupation, two in Texas, one in Idaho, with the integrity of the sites in Alaska, Wyoming, and Pennsylvania. The three sites claimed to be older than 13,000 years ago all showed patterns of significant mixing while others did not. So that is the summation of this article, and I did hear later on that Galt was mentioned as one of those two sites in Texas. And so with that, I turn it over to you, Dr. Wernicke. And I should say that, first of all, uh, 
debate in science is healthy. Absolutely. I agree. And uh, some of the authors of that paper I regard as at least, at least friendly colleagues, if not friends. <laughs> but uh, I should say that uh, the University of Wyoming has been a center of the Clovis first crowd, shall we say. First of all, I am not a statistician, so I can't possibly really speak to how good that statistic is. I will say just from a layman's point of view, I find it really, really suspicious that you could come up with any statistic that would actually look at disparate geological situations across thousands of miles and compare them. Maybe you can. I don't know. But then they came up with some of their own rules of evidence. So it had to be a discrete buried component, which actually is relatively rare in archaeology. And it had to have sufficient number of artifacts. Right. I particularly enjoyed the quote in there that said, there were probably only about six artifacts at Monteverde that anyone agreed about. Now, first of all, I would disagree with that. But then again, we did the lithic analysis at Monteverde. <laughs> and I can tell you, I've seen those things close up, and I have no problem with them being artifacts. Right. But I thought it was interesting that, for instance, in Monteverde's case, that they looked at those six artifacts that maybe people agree with, and that isn't enough. I, I don't know. If I found a beer can on the moon, I would pretty much say that people had been there. No, I mean, you may have to find a six pack. One artifact it pretty much tells you that something's going on. But also, you know, they ignored the structure. They ignored seaweed that came from 40 miles away. They ignored the, these tent poles with vegetal matter tied in knots on them. You know, they ignored all the rest of the human-made artifacts. They ignored the human footprint found in the same stratigraphy. Good point. Well, you have to look at all of it. You can't just look at that. If you're looking at just gold, if you read through their supplementary material, you'll find that they made up the statistics for gold because we haven't published any of those yet. Uh-oh. Our monograph that is going to the publisher this year. And actually, I was wondering where they got that column that they uh, examined. They have it in the supplementary thing. I sat down with their curator. We were like, where did this come from? And it doesn't compare to anything we have. And comparing one unit across 30 acres also seems rather short-sighted to me. Or only three it sites in totality. Like the next unit is not going to be like the next unit. But the fact is their data for Galt isn't good. So whatever the statistics is, whether it's a good model or a bad model, doesn't matter. Garbage in, garbage out. And I will say, they said Galt was the best of the worst. <laughs> they, yeah. they didn't dismiss us all together. They said, well, there seems to be some mixing, but it's better than the other ones. Um, but, yeah, I, you know, like I said, I, I'm not real fond of the idea of the statistic. I they didn't use flight counts from Galt. They had to extrapolate them from some other things that we published, and the extrapolations aren't very good. And like I said, you know, we have pretty simple rules of evidence when you're looking at early archaeology. You have to have good geological context, good stratigraphy, unmistakably human artifacts, and good dates. You don't get to keep piling on more rules. This is, you know, why people, you know, Jim Adavasio stopped talking about Mont or about uh, Meadowcraft Rock Shelter because people kept saying, well, yeah, you did that, but now you should do this. They just kept coming up with another rule. Right. And it's like, you know, again, like I said, in some cases, it's pretty simple. If you find a beer can on the moon, people have been to the moon. If you find six human artifacts in well-dated stratigraphy at Monteverde, you have a human occupation. It doesn't have to be 100. It doesn't have to be 200. Right. The other thing I find interesting about the stratigraphic argument is that the authors, or at least some of them on there, all dug those sites in Alaska. And son of a gun, theirs are all good, and everyone else's is wrong. So eh, I think there's a point. bit of bias there, too. Interesting point. 
Well, uh, again, I thank you for your reply to that because oftentimes, you know, from our standpoint, we only get to see that one side and we don't have the inside information. We don't have all like you've been able to clarify things for information that has yet to be published. And so, you know, it's always important for us to get it from the source. So, again, I thank you for your time and your effort for uh, putting those thoughts together for us and kind of giving us the backstory so that we understand better yeah. where some of this is coming from. Well, the, you know, the, the press releases go out and the newspapers and the online sources and the TV stations simplify it. Sure. So right now there's a lot of really good headlines about there. But if you look back when we were doing stuff, there's a lot of good ones about Galt, some of which I don't agree at all. Right. There was one that they're still kidding me about where somebody said I was quoted as saying this was the most important site in the galaxy right now, wow. which I completely <laughs> deny ever saying. <laughs> that is a pretty epic statement, nonetheless. It, it might be in the solar system, but not the galaxy. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're clearing, we're clarifying all sorts of things tonight. Uh, absolutely. So you heard it here first, folks. He did not say that. I did um, not say that. That's right. So, Dr. Wernicke, as we're wrapping up here, again, we thank you for your time. I have learned a lot and clarified a lot about the incredible site of Galt, Texas. Now, you do depend very heavily at, or at least you have in the past and you may in the future as well, you depend heavily upon a volunteer force. So, tell us a little bit about volunteer opportunities that may be available and what's coming up at the site. Uh, we have volunteers that work in our lab. Uh, right now, I believe we have 32 volunteers and a couple of graduate students and interns. Um, and we have volunteers that work in the field. Uh, Galt is a data point, as I mentioned before. It is not a pattern. And what archaeologists look for is patterns. That's what cultures are. You know, we talk about the Clovis culture, the Folsom culture. It's a pattern of human behavior. Mind you, it's not Clovis people. There is no such thing as Clovis people. It irks me to no end that even some of my colleagues say that. Right. Clovis is a technology that's spread over a very wide area. I doubt even all those people spoke the same language. So when we're looking at those things, we need to find other sites with the same kind of dates, the same kind of stratigraphy. The, you know. So we test usually about 10 sites here in Texas every year uh, looking for that. Uh, in fact, right now, we actually have uh, three really nice sites with Clovis materials on them. I got my fingers crossed. <laughs> but uh, as my field crew says, you got to kiss a lot of frogs. Right. Basically, ultimately, yeah. <laughs> after all the different ways we have of narrowing down areas to look, you still have to dig a hole. And oftentimes, there's nothing in the bottom of that hole. Absolutely. So. Well, it's yeah. again, we encourage people to get out there, volunteer on sites when you can, be a part of the archaeology, take ownership of your local sites, and you will certainly learn something and you'll be better for it. So if people want to learn more about the Galt School of Archaeological Research or if they want to contact you, uh, how would they go about doing so? Well, we have a website, galtschool.org. And uh, the Galt School website has information on how to volunteer how to join us because we depend on donations and members and things like that. Uh, and uh, it has calendars of events and information about Galt as well. I should say that uh, we are also working with a three-time Emmy nominee, Olive Talley, on a film about the Galt site. Uh, and she has a website called galtfilm.com that has a, a number of interviews with Dr. Collins and others on it that people would really enjoy if they'd like to go see those. Excellent. Yeah, we'll keep an eye out for that. And again, it's uh, an important site. It's got so much to offer, so much for everyone to learn from Galt, Texas. It has been a true honor, Dr. Wernicke, to have you on the show tonight to learn more about this incredible site. And we certainly would hope to have you back in the future here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Thank you for having me. Clark Wernicke, boy, somebody who really keeps up, obviously, with all of the current status on various developments in paleoanthropology. 
and also some of the debates and discourse happening in this field right now. Jason, I'm glad that you asked some of the questions that you did because it's evident that there seems to be, and this is surprising to me, some kind of division right now in the community about the ever-timely topic of earlier than Clovis. Now, you know, for years we've kind of thought that was well established, but there have been a you know contingency of archaeologists who have played, I think, that very necessary role of trying to introduce a counterpoint, and they have very skeptically kind of implied that a reinterpretation of pre-Clovis maybe does not point to what people once thought it was. But there are some problems with the paper, as Wernicke seems to point out. Would you like to comment on that here in the final kind of segment? Well, I thought it was important to at least bring that up because trying to be timely and staying on top of the news and everything that's happening constantly and the uh, controversy of the peopling of America, I thought it was a very important point, you know, being that he has spent so much time there at Galt with people like Bruce Bradley and Mike Collins and various other people who have come through there over the years. uh, It's sort of essentially being called out that way. I thought, you know, it was at least appropriate to give him the opportunity to speak on the validity of those claims. And as you heard during the interview, it wasn't necessarily favorable what he had to say about the data and the way that it was presented in that particular paper. Now, let it be said, you know, we are obviously not professional archaeologists here. We are, you know, someone, uh, all of us who are people that are involved with archaeology. We have a great interest in it, but we certainly want to leave that up to the professionals to make those sort of interpretations. But here you have a clear, uh, obvious, you know, differing uh, set of opinions between two very well-known and respected archaeologists within the field, Dr. Wernicke and, of course, Dr. Suravel from the University of Wyoming. Now, he did mention, uh, Dr. Wernicke mentioned during the interview there that the University of Wyoming is essentially a hub for Clovis first. And so, you know, we would expect this sort of uh, thing coming out of that particular school. And and that's not saying anything negative about that university. It's a fine university and it's produced many uh, wonderful archaeologists over the years. But nonetheless, it is sort of that mindset of, you know, this is how we see things. We see Clovis first, and this is the reasons why. And when you have something that steps outside of those parameters, it's going to be controversial. Now, to a degree, I think that controversy is good. You know, it's good to have debate. It's good to have peer review. It's good to bring up these conversations and have opposing views. That's how we move science forward. But it's also very important to make sure that it's being done properly and ethically. And uh, if someone is saying that is not the case, then it certainly needs to be looked at a little bit closer. Yeah, I agree. And it's important, I think, to challenge our, you know, conceptions about and preconceptions about archaeology and any field of science. Never take for granted that things are necessarily as they appear to be or, more importantly, as humans interpret them to be. But go where the evidence leads. Now, for my own part, there is abundant evidence that suggests that there were people here earlier than Clovis. And Galt is one of those sites that has really, truly been a game changer in that regard. You know, with the optically stimulated luminescence dating of some of the lithics and other things recovered from that site, it seems indisputable to me that we have something that is, of course, also stratigraphically significantly lower than Clovis. And so we have to be looking at something that appears to point to an earlier presence. But, of course, we didn't have those kinds of sites many decades ago because people, due to their preconceptions and biases at that time, they didn't go down deeper. They didn't look for anything lower than Clovis because it was accepted and expected. But that's as old as things got. So, I mean, we do have to be challenging ourselves at times, whether it is in terms of pushing us outside the boundaries of what we thought was possible. Or sometimes if we stray too far outside those boundaries, you know, maybe sometimes, you know, kind of reining in on things. But it's interesting to see with all the data that has been accumulated in recent decades. It's interesting to see that this debate has somewhat been reinvigorated. But I know one question that has been on the mind of geologist James Waldo, what was it about that region of New Mexico that was so special that attracted people in ancient times? Yeah, I mean, that that kind of is the question. And, you know, it, as I think most people would, would recognize that the, the climate uh, 30 or 40,000 years ago in the height of the of the uh, last major glaciation in North America was much different than it is now. And, you know, obviously, uh, New Mexico was very attractive to these groups of people for some reason, probably because there was food. But one thing that a lot of people don't realize about New Mexico up until, well, 
for the last few million years, up to about 3,500 years ago, New Mexico was very volcanically active. I mean, it was like Mordor in, in a lot of a lot of sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, from the northeast corner of the state through the middle of the state, all the way down through the southwest, there's hundreds of volcanoes. Uh, and some of them are really, really large. And uh, that had to, you know, there had to be volcanic eruptions and all types of things going on there in New Mexico during the time that that humans were there. So whatever it was about New Mexico that was, that was attractive, it was attractive enough to, for them to, you know, brave those, that type of environment to, you know, they at least had to walk across parts of the state to get to the, you know, to get to the more attractive part. So uh, I found that very interesting. And I've often, you know, just wondered, you know, what, what really was it? Obviously there was a lot of wildlife there. There were mammoths there, probably, you know, it had to be a robust ecosystem for large mammals to be there. There has to be the whole pyramid of biodiversity under, you know, underneath that. So I don't know. It's a, it's probably not an answerable question, but it's certainly fun to think about. I was thinking about this the other day, though, actually, James, not what you're saying, but in a line sort of with that sort of thought, somewhat, yes, the same. Yeah. Nowadays, when we go on vacations, if we're going to go to a place, you know, we're going to look at Airbnbs or hotels and we want to find something that's close to restaurants, right? Sure. Yeah. And, you know, I think that that's just a time honored tradition. People want to go where they are in near proximity to the food that they plan to eat. And, you know, it very well may have been something about that habitat just was very conducive to, if not the food itself, maybe the way that the food was acquired. When we look at some of these, you know, mammoth kill sites, we're essentially very similar functions to the bison jumps that you can visit today in places like Wyoming. You know, these large animals will be run off of a cliff, and then it was a very easy process of going down, dispatching any animals that may still be alive, those who didn't survive the fall, simply butchering. Maybe, and this is just speculation on my part, but it could be a combination of some of those factors that combine to shape an area, a habitat, you know, where food is not only abundant, but also more easily accessible for some of those factors. Maybe that plays a role, too. I don't know. But again, you know, we can do our best to try and use the archaeological, the geological, the paleoclimatological puzzle pieces, put it all together and try to assemble that clearer picture of the past without a time machine guys that's about as good as it's going to get but i'm going to tell you right now what really helps me move my mind into time travel mode is a guinness which we have on tap here as always at the cross time pub so gentlemen will you join me for one more round as is always the case here as we wind down another edition of the seven ages audio journal absolutely and as i like to say if you can't have a good time at least have a cross time yeah if you can't have a good time have a good beer right jason are you game <laughs> I'm already there. Yeah, there he is. All right. Well, on behalf of Jason Pintrell, James Waldo, and yours truly, I am Micah Hanks, and we are, of course, the Seven Ages Research Associates. Follow us online at sevenages.org. You can follow us on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, and on Facebook. We always love to hear from you guys, so you can email us, and the emails are right there on the website. But as always, we will continue our adventures in the study of the past next time, and you guys take care in the meantime. We will return here again on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. <laughs>